that, we're honored to have uh, John Swick, and uh, he came uh, all the way from uh, Colorado to give us some of the, uh, the history of, uh, of, of the Stensons. He's uh, written several books, and uh, uh, specifically uh, about the, uh, the Stenson here. He had so much information that he had to put it in two books. So we appreciate you coming. John? Thank you, thank you. I think I can talk. Oh, this. okay. Let me see if this works. Shut this one off, Randy? Yeah. Uh, does this work? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh my, I sound loud. <laughs> uh, Would you hand those out? This is a handout. We'll start with that. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was a fun adventure putting the books together. Uh, we'll talk about uh, a quick little thing of history, and then we'll start with the three plays. And as we go along, if people have questions, raise your hand. Uh, if you, or if you disagree with me, uh, I've been had a couple of these forums where not everybody agreed with me, but. Uh, uh, we'll look at that uh, as they're handing these out. A sense in history really is divided into three things. 25 to 32, that was the part that Eddie Stinson uh, run the factory, then he was killed in an aircraft accident. 33 to 45, that was the Reliant, the Gull Wing, the Straight Wings, and then 38 on, they started with the three place, which was developed into the 108 as we think of it today. Um, but let's start with the handout. Um, these are kind of fun. John, I probably should have stated up front that uh, this portion is going to be about an hour, about an hour if that works for you. Well, yeah. shut me off when I, okay. when, I run out, when I run out of my hour, tell me. You know, Keep I'm a politician, so you have to, have to remember. <laughs> you got my vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, say the time is up, we'll, we'll go on. Um, on the first page, production history. I take a look at that. Uh, this is this come out of the, one of the books, but it's kind of interesting as we look at them. On the top, the the wingspan and all the aircraft are the same. Uh, the 34 uh, foot, the wing cord is the same. I brought a wing rib with me. It's uh, not a very good example. I collect wing ribs. I have about 14 or 15. If anybody has a wing rib that I can trade you a book for, or I can deal with it. I, I collect wing ribs. I have about 14. 14 or 50 of these. I just, in fact, I, before I left, I, had a, I just got a 42 Stearman rib from somebody that sent me. So I would, I'm always looking for wing ribs. Um, they use the same airfoil section all the way through. They rebuilt the ends. The, the first ones were spruce spars and the, the L5, uh, they, were, they built it almost out of wood because the metal shortage. And that's how they pitched the, the government that we're not going to use the critical metals. And then on the uh, uh, the, the, the pre-war ones. And in looking down, uh, the interesting thing is the gross weight that the three place, the 105 and the 75 horse engine, they were two place side by side. People have seen them, somebody sitting behind them. That 75 horse engine, three people in it, it was a ground lever. Uh, you want to fly at, at sea level in a cool day <laughs> with three people on board. Um, but it's really interesting, they use the same external shape of the wing from the first three place straight through to the 108-3. They just keep pushing the gross weight up because they had more horsepower. And, and uh, it's really interesting as, the, as you look down there the, as the weights went up, uh, but they still use the same airfoil sequencing, same uh, uh, you know, uh, what is the term? Uh, pounds per square foot lift. Wing yeah, wing loading. Just gets getting heavier and heavier and heavier. But they, you guys, we fly them and they fly good. But it's amazing how they was able to push the gross weight up and use the same wing. Never change the exterior shape of the wing. Um, the bottom down, we won't get into that at the moment. That deals with... Uh, the station wagon production, then they build them both ways. Um, so let's move on. Um, uh, in 1938, Simpson, we'll, we'll skip over the round engine ones. Um, 
Incidentally, I have a book coming out. I thought I'd have it for graphic design, but I didn't have it out of graphic design to got here. On oh, dealing of the Stinson from 25 to 43, all the round engine, the gull rings, the straight wings. It'll be out sometime in 2019. But we'll just skip over that. Uh, the thing, the biggest thing that changed, Stinson was killed in a wreck in uh, uh, 32 and 33. Two fellows from Robert Hall and Robert Ayer, they worked for the Greenville Brothers Racing Company, they made GB Racers. And they went to Stinson and was looking for a job, and they hired them. And they redesigned the, what we think of the, uh, the SR series, uh, the straight wing and then and the later the gull wings. And they developed the landing gear like we have in our Stinson today. They developed that at that time, that concept. Now they scale them down when they come to the, to the smaller airplanes, but the concept of having the landing gear with a uh, shock absorber in each one, they, they, they engineered that in the, in the, in the pre-war Stinson's. But in 38, uh, Stinson did a survey. They were looking at J3 Cubs, and I pick on J3s. If anybody has J3, uh, don't be offended because I give them the Dickens. Uh, they were poorly made. They were cheap. Uh, they didn't have any 43, what is it, 41, 30 tubing in. They all used cheap tubing in them. And Stinson looked at that and said, you know, there's an opportunity to sell an airplane, a small airplane, a, a notch above that, a bit smaller than their gull wings. And so they did a, a survey and they realized it was an opportunity. And so they developed this, the three plates with two people sitting in front and one person behind to keep the center of gravity in line. And the biggest thing about that, they had spin troubles. They, they, they go into flat spins. They had a really trouble. In fact, the company almost decided to discontinue and drop the whole thing because they didn't think they could cure this, the spin. They, they would go flat spin and you could spin them clear to the ground. Get a flat spin, actually the you know, uh, center of gravity will, you'll, your engine will quit because it won't feed out of the wings. Um, anyhow, they had a test pilot that said, well, you know, it takes a lot more up elevator travel to make a three point because nobody had tried gear at that time, um, than it does in flight. And he said, why don't we put a stop in this? So they put a stop in a thing, which is true in all the airplanes today, that when you lower the flaps, you can pull the controls back, you can make a three-point landing. But when you get up in flight, you lower the flaps, you can't pull it back, and you can't get enough up elevator trouble, and it makes it really, there become almost a spin-proof airplane. And the stability at that, at you, if anybody's tried it, they'll come right back out. It's really hard to do it, but you can't get enough elevator travel to do that. Now, the, the thing that you want to be careful of, somebody decides, well, we're going to lower the flaps and we're going to spin it. These 108s will flat spin, and then you want to be really careful of that. So sure, you can, you, could, you could get enough elevator travel to jerk it into a spin, but they'll go flat. They had trouble with that in 45 as they was... 46 when they were certifying them. So really be careful of that. It can be done, but uh, once you get in a flat spin, it's very difficult to get out of them. We won't get into the aerodynamics of that, but it's, it's very difficult. Do you want that's only with flaps on? Yeah, when you lower the flaps, you can have more elevator trouble, elevator. Oh, yeah. And then with the an elevator, you can jerk it into a steep small, and then you can spin it. But they had trouble at the factory when they were testing them they'd go flat. And they're really hard to recover from a flat spin. So, you know, it, don't, <laughs> don't, try. don't try it. That's my advice is don't try it. <laughs> uh, you know, with, with uh, flaps up, it's, they're very hard to, hard to, and they recover very quickly. And they convinced the old CAA that this was a way to do it. Um, Looking ahead at 45, so they developed the three-place airplanes. Um, and at the end of World War II, the Stinson was owned by, Eddie Stinson sold out to the Cord Company. And uh, Stinson was always owned by big back east money. Uh, they, they were never a public company as we think about it. They were manipulated by back east New York investors. Um, at, by the time in 45, the Simpson was owned by Consolidated Vaulty in San Diego, California. They, can, they owned them. They were just a division of the Consolidated Vaulty. 
they were a freestanding company and they had their own management, but they, uh, and so they decided to do a four place airplane. They looked at one, 125 horse Lycoming uh, and it wasn't enough power for a, for a four place airplane. And uh, Franklin approached them and said, hey, we can sell you a six cylinder engine that runs smooth. Uh, two things, we can build them, we can, and in 45, everything was hard to get. Uh, engines were, was, everything was difficult coming out of the war to get production equipment. Franklin said, we can deliver engines and we can sell them cheaper to you than uh, Continental or Lycoming, and they were way cheaper. Well, Stinson liked that, and that's why we have Franklin engines, because the price point. They could deliver them, but the price was, they were way cheaper than, than Continental or Lycoming. Um, they uh, uh, bought two 10As and they started to look at them and they cut the fuselage off and just grafted a piece in and made them longer, the, the prototypes. And, and uh, uh, worked them up to the, and it's, it's, it's interesting, there was a serial number one and serial number two prototypes and at the end they just they junked them and then there's serial number one, serial number two of the 108 series. It was actually two serial number one, serial number twos. But, there was, but the prototypes that were 10 A's that they developed into four place airplanes, they scrapped them. Uh, they, were, they were strictly experimental aircraft. Uh, they were designed, one of them was designed for flight test, the other was designed for, for uh, marketing purposes. Uh, uh, Stinson was really pushed, consolidated headquarters, really pushed them to get the airplane to production. And if I looked out here, I didn't see a straight 108 out here unless one came in that I, after I looked at it. But if you, if you look at a straight 108, they have a different instrument panel. They have 10A, some 10A tooling in the instrument panel. And the door handles, like all these airplanes, have the aluminum uh, door handles you get in. Well, the 10As had a, just a, 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 a piece of tubing, steel tubing, that was fastened in a loop. And so they used a lot of 10A, and they used 10A control wheels. Most all the, the 108s, straight 108s, had a different control wheel than all these airplanes because they had those on hand. And as soon as the tooling came available, they put the engine in, put the aluminum handles on, and they become the 108-1. And that was supposed to be the first production model, but San Diego was pushing them so hard to get airplanes in production that they, that those one straight 108s have a lot of 10A parts in them. Uh, the, oh, let's see, where are we at here? Then they went on to the 108-2 with the engine. Bigger than the thing, we're gonna jump right ahead to the 108-3. Stinson was looking ahead. Um, they were doing two things. They were developing a low wing pusher uh, with a four or five place low wing pusher and they planned to get it certified. It takes a while to do that. I actually had one flew and they actually flew it to California. But they looked at the 108-3 and they had several engineering goals. One, they changed the 50, put 50 gallon tanks in it and they increased the weight to 2,400 pounds uh, and they, but the wind is long, but what they did, they just took the cabin and pushed it back into the, into the fuselage farther, about, I don't know, six, eight inches, and then lengthened the window. Uh, some people think that they, they made the fuselage longer. They didn't. They just shoved the interior back into the, into the fuselage a little farther. But Stinson had the goal that as far as... Um, they want to build airplanes clear to, uh, to 1950, and the 108-3 uh, had the 165 horse engine in it. In order to get the gross weight up, they changed the tubing in the bottom of the fuselage around the landing gear and the structure, and they bought tubing that had thicker wall. The outside didn't change, but it had thicker um, uh, walls of the steel tubing, and that's how they got the, raised the gross weight because they, they structured it 
It looked the same, but they used different steel tubing in it. And their goal was, and they built one of these in 1949, have a 180 horse engine, a 180 short Franklin, and they actually built one. Uh, and it was flying. And then their goal was in 1950, they would use a uh, uh, 225 horse engine. And they talked to Franklin, and Franklin was building a 225 horse engine. At that time, they were out of production, but uh, for the CB, and they was going to turn it around and make it a tractor engine. And so their, their uh, 48 would be 165, 49, 180 horse, and 50 would be a 225 horse engine. Um, was, the, was their plan to do this. And then in 51, they, they would have the, the low wing uh, all metal pusher certified. And that was, to re, that was to replace the 108. That was their marketing plan. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting, and show my bias here a little, and the, the, uh, June 29, 1947, they delivered the, the 3,000 Stinson since VJ Day. And you have to remember, this was 1946. It was inconceivable anybody buy a Japanese car in 1947. Yeah, they would drive you off the road. You, wouldn't, you, you would never make it home with one. There wasn't any available. It was inconceivable, but it was really interesting. They did a bunch of publicity. The 3,000 Stinson since VJ Day. Uh, this was, people, it was really interesting, the, the, the thinking at the time. Um, in 1948, uh, Simpson had an opportunity to look at the Cessna 1, Ragwing 170, and their engineers looked at that, and their attitude was that we were building a much superior airplane. If anybody looked at a Ragwing 170, the first one's come out, um, they said, well, uh, uh, we're, the Cessna's building an airplane, an uh, uh, inexpensive build airplane on a cheap, inexpensive to build landing gear on a cheap airplane. And, and if you look at a Ragwing 170 and you look at your 108-3, it's a much superior aircraft all the way around. If you just look at it now, Cessna went on and developed them. And the Cessna looked at the spring steel landing gear. Now those old straight steel landing gears don't absorb uh, uh, shock. The, the only thing you get is the landing gear flopping back and forth on the, on the ground, where the Stinson gear absorbs shock and it didn't put near as much stress on the, on the airframe, and it's easier for the passengers you're riding in, in rough fields or over fields. Where the real thing here, just, it does not absorb landing. It, it, it shock either goes into the airframe, or your tires go back and forth on the, on the, on the thing. People think that the steel spring gear is really, that early gear was really wonderful, and it, in my opinion, it was just uh, a cheap way to build an airplane. Um, on their steel spring gear, and, and Stinson people, um, their engineers looked at this. Now we're going to go into the Piper takeover. Um, is there any questions before we get into the Piper thing? So we're going through this. I'm going quite fast. If I'm going too fast, no, this is good stuff. weigh your hands. <coughs> um, well, Piper, old man Piper, William Piper, um, wrote down on a piece of paper in 1945 what the wholesale price of a J3 would be. And it was a, below the price, the cost of production. He didn't do any analysis, he just wrote down and said, we're gonna sell it for this much money. And the Piper lost money on every J3. Uh, this lost tons of money, and they were in receivership. So the J, it's the J3's fault that production stopped, and we'll get into that, because old man Piper, Bill Piper, just said we're gonna sell it this cheap, and there was no analysis, and they lost money, and, and they, they were, went into receivership. Well, the, so we got Piper over here in receivership. They didn't go into bankruptcy. They sent a turnaround. The, the, it was all owned, he owned a lot of money to back east money, New York money, and they sent a turnaround specialist out to turn him around. He had lots of assets. He had lots of, lots of things, but he didn't have any money, and so they were, shut the, Piper now, we don't need to get into that, but they were, had a turnaround specialist. Piper, Will and Piper were still on the board, but he didn't have control of the airplane. The, the finance people controlled the Piper at that time. And they said he got enough assets. On the other hand, Consolidated Volte, which owned Stinson, was building B-36s, and they were just losing their shirt on B-36s. 
they were building parts in San Diego. They were, uh, had them in um, Texas, uh, Fort Worth. And they were just, just running in the red terribly on, on B-36 production. Well, the Back East Money looked at this and said, hey, we got a lot of money in this. Now, Consolidated Volte owned um, some airports, they owned some uh, railroads, they owned a whole bunch of assets besides the airplane division. So the Back East Money said, we're just going to cut the, the place in two, we're going to keep the, the profit-making end of this, and we're going to get rid of the airplane thing. Um, they couldn't find anybody that wanted to buy it, and they convinced a guy by the name of Floyd Oldman. Um, they paid, they give 500, $5,500,000 to take it. That's how bad they want to get rid of the aviation end of it. Now, the aviation end of it considered the Stinson Division, the consolidated plant, B-24 plant in, in California, and the B-36 plant in Texas. And I think the old Volte plant was setting empty and went with them. I'm not sure. Anyhow, so he, he took this thing over, uh, and the profit went with the New York money, and this guy had the uh, aviation division. Well, he looked this thing all over, and he said, I think I can turn the B-36 thing around. We had the opportunity to do some airline. They ultimately, Convair made some uh, commercial airplanes, and they went into more military. I can turn this around. But Stinson was foreign to him, that, that, and he said, I want rid of that. He thought, I'll just close it down. He said, we'll just shut it down and that'll be the end of it. Well, the management in San Diego convinced him that they should move it to the production to San Diego. Uh, the factory had, they could sell the factory. Actually, actually, the factory was sold to General Motors and they built Allison transmissions in it for a long time. I don't know if the factory is still standing or not. So we have, they uh, convinced him they were going to move this to the, production to San Diego and they were going to build 108-3s until the market and they were just going to d drop them. Um, well, they were selling fairly well. They, when they stopped production in July of 1948, they had 553 airplanes, some around the factory and a whole bunch at Willow Run uh, at the uh, B-24 plant that Ford had which is shut down and will run. They shut it down, there'll be enough airplanes to keep the dealership happy until they get production started in San Diego. Well, somebody, the Back East Money, talked to each other and, and they knew that he was trying to get rid of Stinson and somebody said, well, why don't you just force this onto Piper? That'd be the easy way to get rid of it, just give it, force it all onto him. Now, old man Piper was dead set against this. Uh, he said, I'll never build a Stinson in one of my factories. Um, uh, he was really he was he was a J3 mentality. He he couldn't think of anything better than they, they were making some uh, the three place airplane the super cruisers at the time, but um, he couldn't think of anything better than that. And but they forced it on him, and so th um, he had to take it. And this was the, how the deal was set up. Um, Um, let me look here just a second. Um, Piper off issued 100,000 shares of common stock. There was no money changed hands. Piper didn't have any money. So they, gave, they issued 100,000 shares of Piper stock to Consolidated Volte. And cons Consolidated Volte, now he, Consolidated Volte owned the factory. Um, uh, they, in the deal, they got to keep all the stamping equipment, but Piper got all the parts, all the, anything that, unassembled parts, all the tubing, all of this, that stuff. Well, Piper got into that airplane and flew to, I don't know what he flew, but he flew to Wayne and looked at the factory and said, hey, uh, we can use all this stuff. They had barrels and barrels of dope, they had hundreds of yards of fabric, they had lots of steel tubing. The, the first uh, pacers used the windows of the Stinson, if you look at a pacer, uh, the first early pacers, all of those used the, the dome light out of a 108-3, the same thing, they just took them back with them. 
Um, so he saw the value of all of this stuff. Well, when they, Stinson, the way the deal was cut, uh, Consolidated Volunteer owned the aircraft, and then Piper's dealers picked them up. Then Piper, it was a good deal for them in the sense that when a Piper dealer, or Stinson dealer, because they were owned by Piper now, uh, they, Piper paid Consolidated Volte $480 per airplane. Then Piper sold the airplane to the dealer at whatever their dealer wholesale price was, 23% or 22% off of the retail price. Um, but Consolidated Volte, each one got a, uh, uh, they got $480 per aircraft. But they owned the, part of the deal, they owned the aircraft. So they took, um, they, uh, how many did they move? They moved 100. Uh, they w had to get them away from the factory because they sold the factory. They took 170 aircraft, 100, 107, 107 aircraft, and they took them and they just painted them in silver paint and they took them and stored them inside the factory, the B-24 plant. They were unassembled. And then the rest of them were all flew over there around the factory because they, they had to get them away from the Wayne factory, but the Will Run factory was very close by, what, five miles or eight miles, something was really close by. And they ferried them over to that. Well, the, so Piper went out and looked at it when they wanted to pick up the, the material uh, to ship it back. And the dies, you know, hey, you stamp aluminum, everybody understands the, the presses. The J3 essentially could be as a home belt. You could build everything in your garage. Piper didn't have the stamping things to stamp the, the rudders and the elevators and the fin, or the big stamping, the ailerons. They had no presses that was anything that would, would fit those dies. They had no capability of using them. So he looked it over and said, we don't have to take them with us. Uh, so they shipped all the and if anybody's been through Univer, you can see the a fuselage that they got. Uh, they shipped all the parts uh, that was going to go to San Diego, all of the all the parts, all the assembled parts, all the steel tubing, all of this. But the dies for the rudder and the fin and the ailerons were just too big, and he just left them there. In fact, I interviewed the son of a scrap dealer that picked them up, and he said his dad just would hold them back, and they hold them back, and they just sold them for scrap. Uh, they didn't go, didn't go back there. The Piper didn't have the type certificate. Um, he wasn't interested in production. So he got back there, started selling parts, um, and uh, uh, they realized that they didn't have enough parts. They disassembled some airplanes for parts. And then they did the corrugation. Somebody, you've seen the rudders, the Univer has them. They, they used the copy to Luscom type corrugation, they made some of them. But when Univer approached Piper to buy the, the design, he said, sure, we'll sell it to him, but he didn't have the type certificate. Now, Univer, or Consolidated Volte, owned the type certificate in San Diego. Stinson never even had it in Wayne, Michigan. They had the paperwork. So they shipped all the stuff from Piper, and Univer, as I interviewed them, they were really stunned when they got the, all the parts. They, didn't, they thought they were getting the whole to make all these, the, the dies, and they didn't come because they were sold for scrap that Wayne before Piper got them, before he didn't ship them back. And then they went to, it was Converb at that time, uh, and convinced them that they should give them the type certificate. So Converb transferred the type certificate right from them right to Univer. It never went to Piper. Uh, and there were rumors out a couple of years ago that Univer didn't have the type certificate. I saw the paperwork. It's not a certificate, it's a letter uh, document from the FAA that they own, own the types of they own it. But uh, they were really stunned when they discovered they didn't have all the, all the dyes to, 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 to produce these parts uh, when, when they got the parts from them. Um, uh, let's go back to the, the handout and flip back here to this, the, the second page on the production slip. Take a look at that. And, and I really feel sorry for some people. There's people that think they have a Piper Stinson because their paperwork was, it says it was built in 1950 or, um, 
uh, 49, but Consolidated Video owned the airplanes, the way the deal was set, and when the, you picked it up, they had all these airplanes sitting out in the field. The, you could just go out and pick out your airplane. Most production airplanes, they come off the line, they're sold relatively quick in sequential order. Here they had all these airplanes sitting around, and you could pick out everything you want. Well, Consolidated, uh, they rewrote the weight and balance the day of the bill of sale. So you picked up an airplane, uh, the dealer picked up an airplane, they, weren't, they were sold through dealers. The dealer picked up the airplane, they rewrote the weight and balance the same day they wrote the bill of sale. Uh, so it looks like the airplane was actually built later. Now if you come down through these picture, these, these things, you look at aircraft serial numbers, uh, you look at the end numbers, and you look at the engine numbers, all in sequential order. As you come down here a ways, uh, you see there's one that was uh, built in 1949, it's uh, serial number 4280. Uh, and I don't have to have the engine number on that, but uh, that was not sold until 72049, but it was actually built, and if you look in sequential order, it was built before the, the production stopped in 7 July of 48. And this is where the confusion is. People think, oh, I, got a, I have a 1949 or 1950 airplane. But if you look down through the sequential order of the production, it was one of those picked up and one of the later ones sold. Uh, and you go down through here, you can see there's 1950s, uh, and, if, and the engine production was, engine numbers were done sequentially, uh, the serial numbers were done sequentially, end numbers run the, sequentially, but the dates are, and they weren't, they were built prior to 1948, but because of the bill of sale was done at the time they, they picked it up from the, from Will Run, um, it suddenly becomes a 1950 airplane. But there wasn't any, anybody uh, take a look at that. That's, that's the confusion. I feel I went to a guy that met a guy a couple years ago and had a, one of these, and he just knew it was built in Piper, and he just knew it was a Piper production. He said it was a Piper aircraft. Uh, they didn't have enough tooling. They didn't have the type certificate. Uh, they couldn't build an airplane. Now, the tragedy is they could have had the whole thing he could have took all the stuff back, and he could have had the, the prototype of the pusher airplane that, so that they could have developed the all-metal low-wing pusher if they wished, and Piper didn't want to fool with that. You know, and it, it comes back to the J-3. If he hadn't lost money on every J-3, he wouldn't have been in the trouble. He wouldn't have had Piper had it forced onto him. It comes back to the, the J-3 production numbers is what really sunk Piper and that's how Stinson was shoved off on Piper, and uh, that's why, as history turns out, that you don't have the tooling and don't have this. It's really, really tragic. So I pick on old William Piper and his J3. <laughs> it's, it's his fault, it really is, because if they hadn't been in, in receivership, Stinson wouldn't have been forced on them. And uh, so, that, 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 that's the tragedy of his decision in 45 on, 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 on the J-3s. But, so that was uh, some that they had to take 400 airplanes, either assembled or unassembled? Yeah, when they stopped production, when they stopped production, they had 553 airplanes. Uh, 107 of them was uh, wingless airplanes, or they're just a, they, they, were, they were all the parts. They were stored inside Willow well Run. The rest of them, was either around the factory or at Willow Run when they saw production. Um, so those are all the ones that went to the Piper dealers? Yeah, they, the no, they, they, no, they had stopped production by the time before Piper got, before it was forced on Piper. And it was actually forced on them. Um, the, but the production had stopped prior to that. In fact, Piper didn't take in control of the airplane until it was January of 50. Uh, before the, or end of December or someplace, uh, the, the negotiations uh, with, between Consolidated and, and the bankers and Piper, uh, Piper didn't really get control of the sense and assets until either December or January, really in January 1950. 
I have to go back and look at that. But there was some negotiation in there. And in the meantime, out of this 553 airplanes, before Piper took over, the Cincinnati dealers were picking up airplanes um, from the pool of aircraft. And the Consolidated Voltage staff at Wayne, Michigan, was rewriting the bill of sale, the weight and balance that took the bill of sale. So all the 553 aircraft, uh, some of them were sold right away, but they were, they were, so they were all going through Stinson dealers to up until January 1950, and then the Piper assumed the, the Stinson dealers. Stinson dealers wasn't very happy about this. Uh, I talked to um, a daughter of a Stinson dealer, um, in fact, she lived at the airport. <laughs> they had an apartment above the hangar, and she lived out at the airport where her dad was a Stinson dealer. And uh, she said, they, they said, uh, I'd heard somebody else say that, the Stinson looked at this Piper and said, if we want to sell cheap airplanes, we'd ought to be selling, we'd be a Piper dealer. They, they really thought Piper would, all their airplanes were, were really, that's their, her quote, her dad said, if, I was going to, well, if I wanted to sell cheap airplanes, I'd already be a Piper dealer. And a lot of the Simpson dealers wouldn't go with Piper. They, they'd drop their dealerships. Um, but, but the airplanes are sold through the Stinson dealership until Piper took over. And then uh, they become Piper dealers. Piper run an ad. Maybe you've seen it. I've got one in the book. In um, 50, they run an ad and said it all. Well, see, the... This was really a good deal for Piper. They, now, the 100,000 shares come back and bought Piper in an unfriendly takeover. Years later, Piper, the family, lost control of the factory. And a contributing factor is this 100,000 shares that's out floating around. Um, people outvoted them and voted them out. But um, the, um, I was going to say, um, It, it, they made really good money on it because they paid 480, uh, what did I say here, $480 per aircraft uh, to Consolidated Volte, $480, and then they in turn sold it to the, their dealer organization for whatever the wholesale price was, 23% off of the retail price or 20% off. So they were making money on this thing. That it bailed that bailed Piper out, essentially. They're they're selling aircraft um, as they they sold through them. And of course, when the all the sense and production was gone, they were they were through with it. Does anybody everybody kind of understand? Are there any questions about this as we're talking about the Piper takeover? Uh, uh, John, on the when the weight and balance state was on here, is that when they had their order? Yes, yeah, it came out at the same time. Because um, my airplane was 1956, my the state was 1956. I'm just curious whether, I mean, whether that was, yeah, where, where that fit into the thing, or maybe they had done some work and we did get the airplane. Um, gave it a new airworthiness. Let me look at this. There's production numbers in here. Just a second, if I can find this. Um, yeah, because it's like where the airplanes test flown and certified when they came out of production. Yeah. And they set aside for, you know, until the dealers pick them up. There, there's a range of whatever. According to me. The, the, um, according to my records, and I could be, I got, the, starting in 47, the, the, the American Aircraft uh, Dealers Association kept very good records from the factory. In fact, and then I got stuff from Univer. And according to, to my records, the last Stinson was sold in April of 1950. That, that, that's when they exhausted the the stock of Stinson, so there, there wasn't any sold after April of 1950. Uh, from Univer, 
from Consolidated Voltage and Piper dealerships. They, they exhausted the airplanes. They, they sold 73, they delivered 73 uh, 108-3s in 1950. That, that all of these had the weight and balance changed over. Now, I don't know about the, about the airworthy certificate. They might change it from utility or something like that, because when it changes category, then it goes into a new, you know, CAA yeah. also may re-register airplanes, because in the early days, when they were originally certified, when was that? It was like 53 or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They became civilian airplanes after the war, and so your registration, some early yeah. certified. Um, I've seen some other airplanes, mostly Luscombs, and they didn't have original uh, airworthy certificates. They were all rewritten, in uh, right. uh, apparently the FAA at some point in time, was, was year, and they had to rewrite all of the uh, airworthy certificates. Every, every one, yeah. yeah, they were all rewritten. Uh, I'm acquainted with, with, with some Luscombs that was rewritten. Uh, so they... Uh, they had to rewrite it, but according to my records, the, the last Simpson was delivered, the new Simpson was delivered in, in April 1950. Was, uh, they, st they still had 73 of them setting it around the factory or, or unassembled ones in, in the, the unassembled ones starting January 1950. So yeah, so, so they quit. It took them that long to get them, get them sold. Uh, but I could, you know, I don't say that I'm infallible. They sold um, 203 airplanes in uh, uh, 1949. Well, Piper, uh, Simpson was letting their dealers have 23 and a half percent. Well, it was more than that. I have to go back and look. They were giving their dealers a really a good discount. Piper, starting out, had never give anybody more than 20% discount on their aircraft. And after Piper took them over, they looked at this and said, hey, we're, we're just going to change your dealers to 20%. Dealer, the Sense dealers box, I mean, you quit taking airplanes. Suddenly the sales went down um, to the Sensen dealers dramatically because Sensen said, why? They just raised the price, they just raised the cost. The retail stayed the same, they just raised the cost to them. And the Sensen dealer says, foo on this. We're not going to do that. Sales went way down. Piper got really panicky about this. They run an ad that said there always be a Stinson, and they raised the discount back up to the Stinson dealers. And then they started started selling airplanes again. But Piper said, we never sold airplane loan 20% discount off of retail. Why should we do this with Stinson? And Stinson had given their dealers one of the best dealer discounts in the industry um, from the wholesale standpoint of it. And Piper said, oh, we... we and, and they, they, the sales went way down. If you look in the book, they, they, they dealt way down. And Piper got really panicky because they needed the money. What are we going to do? With, you know, and so they uh, raised the discount back up. Do you have any information about when they were actually selling through the dealers? Did the dealer <coughs> sell at retail or did they add on like car dealer do today, wax and pinstriping and Jack it way up, and did they sell it under retail? Do you have that? Well, uh, <laughs> every dealer was different. It's kind of like car dealers. Uh, you know, depending on where you lived at, uh, they charged, uh, uh, particularly early on when there's a big demand, they charged, you know, you went back to get the factory, they, they had a delivery charge. Uh, and uh, prep or anything like that. And so the price varied, I think. Um, uh, the, depending on the dealer, mm -hmm. uh, how much they added on, what they what they what they did as far as the, the price, um, and I I feeling that most of them were sold with some kind of delivery charge on them. You paid more than than uh, they didn't sell them right at list list price. Uh, they didn't have offer very many accessories. Uh, additional things for the, for the fact that there wasn't a very long list of additional things you could put on them. They come pretty well equipped. Now, see, they, they offered three types of instrument panels, basic, kind of sort of a mid-level uh, for instrument flight, and they had a full instrument panel. 
and uh, you could order them. Those three, they, they came that way. Uh, and they, they had a radio they put in them. They all, there wasn't many accessories. Now, they did have a, a Simpson would do this, and I know of, uh, it's in the book here. Uh, you could order one without paint, and you could they deliver to you in the silver base coat, and you could paint any color you want. There's a doctor in western Kansas bought one and had it painted white uh, with a red stripe on it, and he flew, flew it. Uh, the oil companies, there's some oil companies bought them and had their own paint trim put on them. Um, they could be bought that way, but I don't think there's very many. Uh, you had, they offered the three versions. Uh, later on, you could get uh, different propellers, but that was about all that they uh, uh, Put on. What, how am I doing for time here? I've used my hour up. Okay. What do we? Uh, we'll talk about a couple other things. Are there any more questions about Piper takeover or, the, or this part of it? Um, they. Um, let's talk about the all all Piper Apache. Uh, several years ago, it was published that that that, that uh, Apache was a Stinson design, and they called it the Stinson, Stinson, Stinson design. And it got published. I don't know why it was published that way. And it got reprinted and reprinted and reprinted. And after it's reprinted enough times, it becomes a gospel truth. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not true. Stinson didn't have any twin engine engineering. Uh, that, that they just didn't have it. They wasn't working on, an, on a twin engine aircraft. And they didn't get any. I, I, I went to Univera and asked them about it. And they said, no, they have all the, the, the engineering, the drawings that come from Piper. They got a really good set of, their, their engineering is really good. They said there, there was no, they didn't re inherit any mention of a twin engine airplane and the stuff they got from Piper. And I talked to the curator of the Piper Museum uh, from the, getting ready to put the book. And he said there just wasn't, that's, there was never any, as far as he knew, there was never any twin engine in it. But it's published, people think it's a twin Simpson, but it wasn't. Uh, there was a bill, if you look at it, Apache, they had a clockwise wing, wing just like a J3 wing, that same airfoil on it, if you look at it. The first one had two tails, like a beach, and then they decided to put a single tail uh, uh, on it, but it was all Piper, Piper design. But there's some people just, because it's republished. In fact, there's an article coming out. Sparky Barnes, Sergeant, writes for Sport Aviation Magazine. You've seen some of her articles. Um, she contacted me about, she's doing one on a, on a Stinson, and she sent me a little excerpt to look at, and she had in there the twin Stinson. I wrote her back and said, hey, look at the book. <laughs> I did a whole chapter on this. Uh, so she took that out. Um, they... Uh, Simpson was going to build a flying car, and if you look at the book, there's a picture of the flying car in here. Uh, they had a really an interesting concept on that. They were, they were, now, the, the car itself was made of fiberglass, and it used Crosley parts, but Simpson had an interesting uh, production model and a marketing model on this. They were going to build, because they had this big plant at build B-24s, and it wasn't building anything in it. And so they were going to build the cars and the whole thing there and sell them to Stinson dealers. Then they were going to, they bought out, they would buy outside parts, but they were going to make most of everything themselves. Um, uh, they thought that they would even build their own engines, but when they went into production. Now their plan was that you'd buy the, the car, and there, there's a picture in the front of this, the, the airplane unit would unbolt from the car, and it had fold down legs, and it would stand by itself. So you could, uh, fly the airplane home, uh, push it in the hangar, uh, unbolt the car from the, and then drive the car. Uh, and then when you got ready, you could drive back out, bolt on, and fly off. It was really an interesting concept, and they, they, it flew. Their model was, and they had this figured out that, so you bought one of these, you took it home, you start driving the car back and forth, and the first thing you know, you're going to ding the car up, wear it out. And they figured they'd sell two additional cars for every every airplane that they <laughs> unit that they sold <laughs> because you'd wear the cars out and ding the cars out in the airplane unit would be sent to the hangar. And it was an interesting concept. Uh, and they probably were right, you know. You, you 
ding the cars up and it wouldn't be airworthy and you'd buy another car and they'd go to sell them to Stinson dealers. But they were in financial trouble and when they, this guy took them over, they, they just killed all this stuff. Everything was, everything was, you know, he said no, no more development. No, they spent a lot of money developing the flying car and their concept was, was really interesting to, to, to build that. Um, what else we got? Um, Did you have a picture of the pusher engine? Yes, it's in the book. It's in the book. I yeah. haven't looked at it in a while. I didn't remember the Yeah, it, it was an interesting low wing, four or five place pusher. And according, they had one that flew, and they flew it clear to California, and it was scrapped out there. Piper wouldn't take it. Piper wouldn't take it. He could have had the. They, they had one that was flying, a, a prototype that was flying, and it flew clear to California. And he could have had that with the deal. they just give it to him. Uh, and uh, it, according to the numbers that I got, it had fairly good performance. I think it had a 225 horse Franklin, of course, in it, a pusher airplane, and uh, had fairly good performance. It was low wing, fixed gear, uh, all metal, twin tail, twin boomed, you know, because the engine was in the middle. And uh, they thought that it had really good, you know, comparable performance for the engine. It was, it was, it was good, a four or five place airplane. And of course they wanted to, that was the, the what, the 50 model? Uh, you know, they built a 108-5 in 1950, and they thought that by 51, they would have the pusher certified and be the production. It was going to take their place to the 108. Oh, one of the fun thing is the, the numbers. When they got ready to do the, 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 the 10A and they come out with this, what they're going to do? Well, Consolidated Volsi had a numbering system that they, 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 they numbered their airplanes. And so Stinson management talked to San Diego about a number. And they sent them a number as number seven. And they sat around and talked about this the way I understand it, and they didn't like number seven. Uh, if they'd accepted that, we'd all be flying 107s. Um, <laughs> and, and they said, no, we don't like that. So the, they looked at them and said, how about number eight? And the Stinson advertising people, management liked 108. We're flying 108s. But the first number was, they suggested to them was seven. And they didn't, Stinson didn't like seven. Why, I'm not sure. Uh, but we'd be flying all 107s <laughs> if they'd accepted the first number. You know, Boeing 707, all this stuff. But that was way before any of that stuff, you know, in 45. Uh, but they liked 108. They liked 8. So we were flying 8s, which I thought was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, you got anything else? That, John, yeah. I'm sorry, wait. Do you know if that uh, 3000 uh, Stinson since BJ still exists? The which one? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think I've got the end number someplace you could, we could look it up. Now, two things I've got this, before we forget here. I have a production record of uh, every Sinson 108 that was built from serial number 1 to 5260. And you can look at this. Now, I have a sheet here that you can write it down if you would like. I have this production thing. We'll lay it over. Everybody can look at it after a while. Uh, if you write your end number down, because I can look it up on the, get your address or your address, and I'll sell, send you uh, a, a page, a production page prior to yours, yours and the page after that of your airplane. So anybody can have it. I'll just do it for free. Just I just I can look it up on the computer if I have your end number. I know the fun thing about it. I was in uh, uh, Blakesburg about three years ago, and there was a Stinson there, and I wrote the number down at home. And it was assigned to a 182. It wasn't a good number. <laughs> so if you don't have a good number on your airplane, you better put your address down. <laughs> that happens sometimes, but that's the first time I run into one of a Stinson. But it, it was a 108-3, but it didn't have the, the, the number to be reassigned. In fact, it had the original C, you know, the original N number on it. But the end number had been reassigned to a 180. 
<laughs> money to Cessna. Uh, it wasn't. <laughs> I don't know just how you manage that, but unless you have an accident or some fiasco, the FAA's, you know, and apparently whoever signed it off didn't ever pay attention. <laughs> but if you look it up, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't assigned to a Stinson. Um, but anyhow, also, and then I've got the two books here. The other book is, uh, I had a, Univer was really kind to me. Sometimes people think they're way overpriced. I have nothing to do <laughs> with their price structure. But they allowed me and my brother at that time in their engineering room, and we went through their weight and balance and looked at their engineering things. And we made notes in here uh, when their weight and balance data is in the one book. And uh, particularly down here at the end, um, we did a lot of... Uh, um, um, certified the gross weight changes. Yeah, yeah. They've got a, they've got a, a, a weight and balance sheet on ever since and it was built. Uh, they're all in books setting up on a big shelf and they let us go through them. Uh, they were real kind to me. I have to give them credit for that. And, and the story in there on the book on Univer, they were so afraid that we we're gonna say something bad about them. People have bad mouthed them and over the years and so their sales manager, I wrote a, a, a trial draft and showed it to them and they were worried about it and I said, well, can you write this? And he said, yes. So he wrote the story. The story that's in the book was written by Univer sales manager, and they were happy with it. And it's accurate as far as I can tell, but they were so afraid that I was going to write bad about them. And I said, no, this is going to be a positive book. I write positive books. Uh, in the Leskin book, I beat up on a fellow by the name of Klotz that was the president of the company. Uh, I knew some scandal. And one of the things... So, uh, uh, but they were real kind to me, let me go through their books. The other thing, uh, we'll talk about Eddie Stinson. Uh, this is in the uh, uh, he was wild and he was a, a dreamer and he had this idea of what he wanted to do and he, he designed airplanes but he hired people, pe people, people around him that, that he, uh, that, that, he uh, that he wanted to do, but he, that, but he was smart enough to hire people and uh, the, hire engineering. And if he would have lived, the Stinson company would have been a whole different thing. One of the things, he was demonstrating this, I think it was a Model R. Uh, they were trying to redevelop uh, add on to the to the that first series, and he was just demonstrating it, and he didn't refuel as long toward the evening. He was taking hopping uh, potential customers. They'd run the thing out of gas, and uh, it was out of Chicago. Rather than landing on the beach, uh, somebody convinced him to land on this golf course. He ran into a flagpole uh, with the airplane, the, the, they could have survived that, but he had a very large passenger in the back seat, and he said, fasten your seat belt, and the guy didn't fasten his seat belt. When they hit the flagpole, this guy flew ahead, hit Stinson, crashed his, into the, crushed his chest into the control column and killed him. He lived a while, but died the next day. But if the guy in the back seat would have had his seat belt on, they could have, it was a survival crash, uh, which is really too bad, but the Stinson company would have, been totally different if Eddie Stinson would have survived. And I would say it was bad, but it would be different because they, when they hired these two guys from Greenville Brothers Racing, the GB people, they, they were really fine engineers and they changed the whole direction of the company. Um, I'll quit. Uh, this, I'll, I'll uh, have these out. Anybody can look at this. Uh, where do I want to put them? Over here. Um, I think it'd be easier. Uh, you can go through these and look at it, and I will uh, send you a uh, pages out of this. But you can look at the notes from the, the pencil notes in this one book. Is all we wrote them down as we went through Univers weight and balance sheets. Thank you very much.